Welcome everybody to Southern Maryland Audubon and our presentation of Trouble on the Half Shell with naturalist Carrie Wickstead. I'm Molly Moore. I'm president of Southern Maryland Audubon. And for those of you who are new to our presentations, Southern Maryland Audubon covers uh, St. Charles, St. Mary's, Calvert, and a sliver of Prince George's counties. We offer educational presentations like this one every month from September through May. All are recorded and you can find them on our archives at southernmaryland.org. We are engaged in conservation efforts for birds across Southern Maryland and in our local, state and federal halls of government. We host bird walks and educational events at fabulous locations throughout the year. If you're not a member, we love to invite you into our flock. It's easy to join on our website and it's only $20 little dollars for a whole family membership for a year. And every dollar goes to supporting our conservation and educational programs in support of birds and their habitat. So what you might ask, do turtles have to do with birds? So they are part of the same ecosystems and habitats. For birds to thrive, turtles have to be thriving as well. A breakdown in the environment impacts all forms of wildlife and, and people for that matter. I feel like Terry Wickstead almost needs no introduction. He is one of the favorite nature speakers for master naturalists and hundreds of others across Maryland and beyond who've tuned into her presentations on everything from birds to native plants to yes, turtles. Terry is currently the amphibian and reptile and invasive species program manager for the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. She has more than a decade of experience as an education and outreach specialist. Previously, many of you may have known her as the education and outreach specialist for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife and Heritage Service, where she ran several statewide education programs, including the amazing Wild Acres for backyard wildlife and habitat enthusiasts. And if you're a master naturalist in the audience, chances are Carrie taught at least one of your classes. Her education background at Frostburg State University and West Virginia University covers the conservation gamut, including environmental and evolutionary biology, wildlife and fisheries management, botany and wildlife. She's researched rare, threatened and endangered species throughout Southern Maryland as a natural resources biologist. So a self-described nature nerd, she's not only one of the most knowledgeable speakers on the natural world that you encounter, she's one of the most fun. Carrie, thank you so, so much for speaking with us. Please take it away. Well, thank you, man. That was quite an introduction. So I feel like I have a high bar to meet. So at least I'm talking about turtles tonight, right? Um, so welcome everybody. And thank you for attending and coming to learn about trouble on the half shell and a little bit more information about Maryland's turtles. I'm really excited to be here. So I'm wearing my new hat as the program manager for the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies for Reptiles, Amphibians, and Invasive Species. And then also I'm wearing my PARC hat. And if you're not familiar with PARC, PARC is the Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. And part of my role at AFLA is I serve as the state agency's coordinator for PARC. So if you're not familiar with PARC, I have to give a plug for PARC. Um, we're all about forging proactive partnerships to conserve amphibians, reptiles, and the places that they live. We are an unaffiliated partnership. Um, we exist because of a 501c3 named the Amphibian and Reptile Conservancy, or ARC. Um, but most of what PARC does is all thanks to our amazing network of volunteers. And I'll be talking a little bit about some of the projects that we're working on specifically the projects dealing with the illegal trade in turtles a little bit later. And so my background is not in reptiles and amphibians, but in my former role with Department of Natural Resources, I really fell in love with uh, a lot of reptiles and amphibians, particularly uh, snakes. They were a big thing that I would teach about because coming from a background where, where I was afraid of snakes, it took me a long time to get around to liking them and I thought I could bring that to other people. And I realize now that in my position, uh, my current role and, and all of that, that this 
quote really rings true. Reptiles are not often used to inspire conservation action, but they're fascinating creatures and serve indispensable roles in ecosystems across the planet. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the roles that our local turtles provide and what's at stake with them um, and, and some of the declines that they're experiencing. And this quote is from a research paper that came out last year where essentially they found 20% of all reptiles across the world are threatened with extinction. So they're a very highly threatened group of vertebrates around the world. So turtles are crucial to our ecosystems. They serve in a lot of different roles, roles that you might not expect. You've got things like the wood turtle out in the, the woods along streams and they're drumming up the soil to get worms to come up to the surface, but they're also moving the soil around and helping with kind of those nutrient dynamics in the soil. You've got other ones like box turtles that are out there eating a lot of fruits and pooping out those seeds. And if you see a patch of May apples out, out and about as you're hiking around, there's a very good chance that a box turtle pooped there at one time because May apples and several other forest woodland flowers actually germinate better after going through the digestive tract of a box turtle than just, you know, falling on the ground and um, germinating that way. So they serve as predators, they serve as prey, they serve as seed dispersers and helping with um, the nutrient dynamics and all of that. They also have a lot of cultural significance. And if you look at different cultures around the world, turtles are often um, associated with longevity and creation myths. Um, they symbolize wisdom and tranquility and steadfastness, slow and steady, just like the turtle or the tortoise, right? And even here in North America, in some Native American cultures, it's believed that North America is Turtle Island that was formed on the back of a turtle by muskrat. So there are a lot of touch points in different cultures uh, that really show the importance of turtles across the ages. Some species too, like the gopher tortoise down in the southeastern United States are what we call keystone species. There are over 300 different species that either directly depend on the burrows that gopher tortoises create or indirectly depend on those burrows. So here's your bird connection. Burrowing owls sometimes use those burrows um, to nest in, but also they like to hunt outside those burrows because there are a number of rodents that will also use those burrows and those burrowing owls know that. So they'll come and use it. There are other species like the indigo snake, which is also a, a threatened species in the United States. This, um, oops, this species in particular has to have those gopher tortoise burrows, otherwise, it wouldn't have a habitat to live within. So there's some species that really, really need those, those burrows, and that is what's being provided by that tortoise. One thing I was surprised to learn when I got into my current position is that North America has really high turtle diversity, particularly down in the southeastern United States. We have some of the highest turtle diversity in the entire world, second only to southeastern Asia. And, you know, they're also just darn cute. The more I look at all these pictures of turtles, the more I just fall more and more in love with all of them. And this is a Blanding's turtle, which you can find in some of the northern states and midwestern states. And it's a species that's at risk. So to give you a little bit of turtle biology before jumping into some of the local species, Turtles, unlike other vertebrates, um, don't have movable ribs. So their ribs and their vertebrae are actually attached to the upper part of that, um, of their shell. And so, um, you know, they have the shell, there's a bony layer of the shell, but there's also a layer of skin and blood vessels. And then you've got the layer of, um, of uh, the scales above that. And so the turtles actually need UV light, specifically UVB wavelengths, to be able to penetrate through those scales or those scoots on the upper part of the shell to be able to reach their body and essentially assist with bone growth and, um, and shell growth. And that's one of the reasons why painting turtle shells is really bad for them because it blocks those UVB rays and doesn't allow them to be able to absorb it 
as well as essentially absorbing some of whatever chemicals are in some of those paints that you might find on those turtles. So, um, so that is really important for them. And some turtle species like the box turtles can pull their entire bodies into their shells, but many of them um, have their legs and their heads that extend beyond the shells and they can't always close up into those shells. So the upper part of the shell is called the carapace. Um, the scales again are called the scutes and the lower part of the shell is called the plastron. So as turtles grow, the shell will grow with them. It's a bone that does grow. However, those scutes are not living tissues. So those scutes or those scales on the outer parts of the shell are made up of keratin, much like your fingernails and your hair. And interestingly enough, sometimes um, to, to allow the turtle to grow, these scutes will peel off. So it looks like they'll have flaky shells and that's just the old scutes kind of falling off and uh, being replaced by new ones, so. In Maryland, we have about 22 species of turtles and I have a about symbol there because we've got a couple species that we're keeping our eyes on that might be establishing in the state. And they're likely due to introductions that are happening. There's also a lot of things that are happening with reptile and amphibian um, taxonomy at the moment. There's a lot of lumping and splitting and new species and stuff being decided based on genetics. And so the reptile and amphibian world is quite in flux at the moment. We do know that most of our turtle species in the state are native to Maryland, and there are a couple that have been introduced or naturalized in the state. So our rarest turtle in the state is the bog turtle. This is a federally threatened species. It's the tiniest turtle in North America, and it's also subsequently the tiniest turtle that you can find in, um, in Maryland as well. Its carapace, or the upper shell length, only gets to up around four inches in length. Some hulking bog turtles can get to four and a half inches in length, so not really big. <laughs> the species is mainly found in parts of central Maryland, like in parts of Carroll County and Baltimore County and Hartford County. And it has a very specific habitat that it needs to live in. So these spring fed wetlands, which I'll show you on the next page. So this is an example of one of those wetlands that you would typically find the bog turtles in. They need a lot of sunlight and they need these open grassy hummocks or sedgy hummocks essentially to live within. So a lot of these areas, as you might imagine, in central Maryland have been, um, have the habitats been changed, you know, the wetlands have been altered. Sometimes um, woody vegetation will fill in these wetlands and things like that. So habitat loss is a really big threat to these turtles. And there also has been some indications that the black market trade of some of these bog, bog turtle species has also caused some of their declines. Unfortunately, at the moment, many of the bog turtle populations in Maryland and in other states, um, there's a distinct northern and southern population. And, um, and so a lot of the populations, even these little subpopulations, are so isolated from one another, it's causing some genetic impacts because they're not able to interbreed with other individuals outside of their little subpopulations. So you're starting to see some um, bottleneck effects, or at least what we perceive are some bottleneck effects from all of that. So here's a picture of Andy Adams with the Susquehannock Wildlife Society, just uh, holding a bog turtle during one of the Maryland DNR surveys. And I have this picture here just so you can see how cute and tiny they are. So one of the techniques that Maryland Department of Natural Resources folks use to keep these wetlands open actually bringing in herbivores like goats to eco goats essentially to come in and eat multiple rows and other woody vegetation to allow those areas to maintain um, being open and everything. Of course there's a lot of other work that's also happening um, with the Department of Natural Resources and these extremely special turtles. Moving along to our box turtle. This is an extremely common species across the state. And while it isn't federally listed like the bog turtle, it is a species that's declining throughout much of its range. And um, it's a species of concern in a lot of different states, Maryland included. 
So um, this is a little hatchling just to give you an idea of size right when they hatch. Um, this turtle down here is actually several years old. So um, people are often surprised when they find some of these tiny turtles to learn that they already have a couple years under their belt. So box turtles can live 50 to 80 years. Um, they can have up to two clutches of eggs each year. And you're going to be seeing a lot of box turtles right now, especially with all the rain that we're getting. They're loving it because this is a prime time of year for them to breed and to lay their eggs. And so wet soil makes it really nice and easy for them to be able to dig nests and, uh, and lay their eggs. So May and June typically are the times of year you will see a lot of box turtles crossing the road. And we always suggest if, you, if it's safe to do so, bring them to the side that they're traveling to, not to the side that they're coming from. Otherwise, they're going to want to continue across that road no matter what you do. So um, they do have really, really unique patterns. And sometimes you can distinguish individuals based on their shell patterns. These are my local box turtles right here, um, essentially making the next generation. This male had a beautiful slug stash um, coming down from his face there. So slugs are a favorite food item as well as things like earthworms and all of that. While they do have really colorful shells, uh, they actually can blend in with leaf litter really, really well. So it allows for great camouflage and I'm sure there are a lot of box turtles that you might have walked right by without even knowing. Moving along to a rarer turtle species that we have in Maryland, this is the eastern spiny softshell. This is um, a species of turtle that does not have that hard bony outer shell. Um, and so it has more of a flattened leathery shell and it almost looks like a pancake that's in the water. Um, the flat shell actually allows it really to, to swim in some of these um, cold, where, uh, cold streams out in the western part of the state and also allows it to dig into sandbars and things like that. So they can breathe underwater due to this um, pharyngeal lining um, on, and also like a cloacal lining, which cloacal, their cloaca is their their butt essentially and so they can do that essentially butt breathing to be able to breathe a little bit underwater. Um, the males have this special courtship dance where they nudge the females with their um, their front feet and then also with their head while swimming to try to court them and uh, and so if you're lucky you might see that happening this time of year. And they also, um, they have these, these little snouts right here. And essentially sometimes they'll dig themselves down in sandbars and only their snouts will be kind of protruding up and they'll breathe through that in those sandbars. So um, in other states like West Virginia, they're a little bit more common than they're here, but essentially they're only found in Garrett County in Maryland. And this is a species that I have not seen in the state yet. So really cool. Moving along to a couple of our pond turtle species. So these are the species that spend most of their time in the water. And those include the red-eared slider, which is non-native, and the eastern painted turtle. So these two species are often misidentified as one another. Now the red-eared slider, when it's younger, does have this beautiful red ear coming down from its eye. So it makes that nice and easy to identify. But as they age, they actually will lose that red stripe behind the eye, so they can get a little harder to identify. If you're looking at the upper part of the shell, that carapace right there, you'll see that the scoots don't line up. However, if you look at the painted turtle over here, you can see that those scoots line up and they actually have these kind of white bars in between those scoots. So it looks like white lines going down the back. That's easy to see from a distance as you're looking out with your binoculars at the pond at these turtles sitting on the log. The painted turtles also have these beautiful red and yellow stripes down their face and um, their underside, their, their, um, the, the plastrons are bright like orangey yellow, whereas the red-eared sliders are yellow with black spots along the edges. So that's another way to identify the two if you're just looking at the undersides. 
So the red-eared slider is invasive in Maryland. It has some tendency to outcompete some of our native pond turtles like the eastern painted turtles and also has the propensity to spread disease to some of these native species as well. Red-eared sliders are also probably the most common turtle species in the pet trade and certainly in the 1980s red-eared sliders as pets exploded with the whole teenage mutant ninja turtle craze. And so unfortunately, um, because they live a very long time and have a lot of specific needs, some people did release their red-eared sliders out into the wild, which have now established. And they're certainly a naturalized species here in, in Maryland. Interestingly enough, they are native to parts of West Virginia, but not all parts of West Virginia. <laughs> So it makes it really hard to manage them in some areas of West Virginia because of that um, different, different nativity status. But here they're all introduced and can be problematic in some spots. The next turtle I'm gonna talk about is actually one of my favorite turtle species just because they've got a lot of moxie. And these are the common snapping turtles, AKA just snapping turtles. Um, there are two snapping turtle species in the United States, the common snapping turtle and the alligator snapping turtle. A lot of times people will see some of these younger snapping turtles in Maryland that have some of these bigger ridges on the tops of their shell and think that it is their cousin, the alligator snapping turtle. But um, as far as I know, their alligators are not, uh, alligator snapping turtles are not established in Maryland, even though we have unfortunately had a few that have been released in the state. So snapping turtles, as you might know already, can be quite grumpy on land, but surprisingly, they're relatively docile in the water. So they get really defensive on the land. And this time of year, you're going to see them on the land because the females can travel one to 10 miles. It's rare for them to get to 10 miles, but they can travel several miles just to return to their nesting sites. This is why you will see snapping turtles way away from water sources this time of year, crawling across roads, sometimes climbing over fences. There are pictures of, of snapping turtles climbing over fences to get back to their nesting territories. It's just an amazing homing instinct that they have. So they can travel really long distances to breed. And so I often um, see well-meaning people picking up these pregnant ladies and taking them back to the pond. And I liken it to essentially having a, a pregnant woman show up at the hospital. Somebody says, you don't belong here. You need to go back home and taking them back home to give birth instead of the hospital where she wants to give birth at. So um, just like with the box turtles, if you see snapping turtles crossing the road, even if they look like they're in an area that probably doesn't have a lot of water, the best thing to do is if it's safe to do so, just let them cross to the side that they're trying to get to. And, um, and for snapping turtles, uh, helping them cross can sometimes be a little difficult. I've uh, oftentimes will try to coax them up on like a piece of cardboard or a car mat and drag them the best I can because a lot of them are too heavy to pick up and you never want to pick them up by their tails because their tails are attached to their vertebrae and if you so much weight on that tail sometimes can damage their vertebrae so just uh, something to keep in mind with these species. The other thing about snapping turtles that I think is pretty wild is that they are so prehistoric. They have um, essentially changed very, very little since over the last 90 million years. They literally were around at the time of the dinosaurs and still continue to persist. So what a cool species. The last group of land or I guess freshwater turtles uh, that I'm gonna talk about are some of our declining species. And those include the wood turtle and the spotted turtle. So the wood turtle is mostly found out in western parts of the state. Um, if you look at its shell, you can kind of see these pyramidal shapes um, on the tops of the shell. And people say that it looks a little bit like, like a wood carving, essentially, in, in you know, wooden pyramids that have been carved on the shell. They have bright orange right there along the neck and um, on the legs. And they spend most of their time in streams. So they like to be in um, stream habitats and, and all of that. So much like the bog turtle, um, 
there is an illegal trade for wood turtles. And while these species aren't listed in Maryland yet, there's a lot of push to list them um, at the federal level just because of declining populations across much of their range. Similarly, the spotted turtle is uncommon. Um, and this turtle is um, dark in color and it has these random yellow spots all over. <laughs> it kind of looks like somebody just dripped paint all over it. And this is one that I found down in Charles County. Um, this turtle was found out in Washington County. And so this is one of the few spotted turtles I've seen in Maryland. So they're actually relatives of the bog turtle. So they have some of the similar color patterns with the bottom of their shell and all of that. And they're also a very long lived, slow to grow species too. Last turtle species that I'm gonna talk about is um, one of our largest or actually the largest turtle species in the world and the largest turtle species essentially in Maryland, and that is the leatherback sea turtle. So these turtles can get almost six feet in length. And much like the spiny soft shell, it has a leathery shell on its back. And the reason this one has a leathery shell is that they, it's because they dive so deep underwater um, and they have to deal with immense pressures underwater that if they had a bony shell, it essentially would pop off but uh, the leathery shell allows them to still keep their back on while they're doing these deep dives. This monstrous turtle essentially lives off of jellyfish, which is just mind blowing to me. They're like the size of a Volkswagen Beetle and they live off of jellyfish, which just doesn't seem like there's a lot of calories in it. <laughs> but I was reading a description and essentially said, unlike predators like cheetahs that have to hunt down fast prey like antelope and stuff like that, that they don't always catch. <laughs> um, leatherback sea turtles essentially can just drift through the water with their mouths open and eat jellyfish because jellyfish really aren't, you know, fast moving quarry and all of that. So that's how they essentially save calories while eating jellyfish and grow to massive sizes. So I love this picture here. This is a picture of its head um, taken close up. They're really prehistoric looking animals. And funny story, I tried to post this on Facebook and I got flagged for inappropriate content. <laughs> Which I, I, I had no way to dispute it, but hey, that's what happened with Facebook algorithms. Anyways, uh, occasionally the leatherback sea turtles will swim by the outer shores of Maryland. Um, so we do have them coming through every now and again. The largest turtle in the world was Archelon, and um, that turtle species got up to 13 feet in length. So, um, so really, really big turtles, and, and still that leatherback's amazing. And this is a picture of um, a leatherback model that Dr. Claire um, Walker made for us when I worked with Maryland DNR, and we would take this to different schools to teach about leatherback turtles and just the, the grandiose size that they have. Such a cool turtle. They also have the widest geographic and thermal range of any turtle species in the world. So they can go all the way up north, all the way down south. So in Arctic waters to Central and South America and, and further north, it's just really, really wild species. So moving along, um, I see a question about how diamondbacks are doing. So let's do some trivia. There are over 350 species of turtles in the world. What percentage are threatened? Do you think it's around 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, or greater than 50%? Greater than 50. I'm seeing a little bit over the place, 30%, um, 40%, greater than 50. There's a vote for 20, more 40, 40, 50 plus. And the answer is over 50%. So it's around 60% of the turtles worldwide 
are threatened or endangered in some form or another. So unfortunately, there are a lot of threats to our turtle species. And much like other species, we have habitat loss and degradation as a number one threat to them, but also climate change is affecting them in different ways. So for example, uh, quite a few turtle species, um, the temperature that the eggs actually incubate in, the average temperature can affect the sex ratios. And so we have a phrase, hot chicks and cool dudes. So if the temperature of the nests are really hot, then typically the eggs are going to be female. And if they're cooler, they'll be male. Around 82 degrees, I think I was looking it up, it was 82 degrees, we'll get a almost equal sex ratio for species like box turtles and stuff like that. But as you can imagine, with climate change, we're experiencing warmer temperatures. And so this might essentially skew those sex ratios long-term for our different turtle populations. There are other things that are happening with climate change as well. We've got saltwater intrusion and um, these really big storm events. And then the precipitation changes can also affect the survival of the hatchlings and survival of the eggs. It's all kind of coming together in different ways to affect our turtle species. We also have disease that's affecting them. So unfortunately, ranavirus is a disease that doesn't just affect frogs and salamanders here in Maryland, but box turtles seem to be hit really hard. And as of um, this moment, there's no real cure for ranavirus if turtle species have it. It's a viral infection and it really, I'll have a picture a little bit later that you can kind of see some of that, what it looks like and what it does. We have invasive species that are problematic. So some of these are invasive predators. Some of these are invasive plants that are altering habitats. And uh, some of these are other invasive species of turtles that are out competing or spreading disease. Then we have different predators that are being supplemented by humans. Um, so red foxes and raccoons in particular, I should just say foxes and raccoons, are some of the biggest predators of turtle nests and eggs. And so when we artificially supplement fox and raccoon populations, either by feeding them or medicating them illegally or things like that, we're doing that at the expense of our turtle populations and other things that those predators feed on. And then, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I work on the illegal trade in turtles, and I'll talk about, a little bit about that later on. So I want to really get across the point that turtles are highly vulnerable to loss of breeding adults. And this is because of their reproduction. Um, essentially, most turtle species take a very long time to, able, to be able to reach reproductive maturity. So some species like snapping turtles can take up to 20 years until they can actually lay their first set of eggs. Other species like box turtles take five to eight years to reach sexual maturity. However, when you contrast that with mammal species like black bears that often take five years to reach sexual maturity, or white-tailed deer that can only, only take one year to reach maturity. In the span that it takes one snapping turtle to lay its first nest of eggs, a black bear could have had up to six mature offspring and a white-tailed deer could have had up to 629, essentially originating from that uh, uh, um, first deer and over that 17-year timeline, time line, all of its progeny would have over 600 deer. So here's some of the, um, the just average reproductive ages of some of our local turtle species and the clutch sizes. Clutch means the number of eggs that are laid at one time. So something like our bog turtle has a reproductive age of five to nine years. And sometimes they only lay one egg at a time. And that egg is under so many pressures. It's under pressures of climate change. It's under pressures of nest predators getting it. It's under pressures of people accidentally stepping on it or something like that. Then you've got these tiny little one inch hatchlings that are essentially like chicken nuggets to the animal world. And so they have to fend them for themselves against a lot of predators too. So very few, uh, few turtles actually make it to the adult breeding age. Um, and it's just, you know, essentially how their, their life cycles work. 
So as we talk about the illegal trade, here's another um, trivia question for you. Between 1996 and 2008, what percentage of illegal wildlife trade that was intercepted contained reptiles? And this is a global number. So what, what percentage of illegal wildlife trade contained reptiles? 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, or over 60%? You were going a little bit higher this time. All right. Well, those that said over 60, you are correct. So this is from um, a report from Traffic, and this is a compilation. But essentially, 70% of those reptiles that were intercepted, or 70% of illegally traded wildlife that were intercepted were reptiles. And when you think of illegal wildlife trade, do you think of turtles? Do you think of alligators, snakes? What do you think of? We think a lot about birds and mammals, right? So, um, but, and, and they are part of the trade. So 10% that was intercepted were birds and 6% were mammals, but nowhere close to our reptiles. And that kind of goes back to that initial quote about reptiles just being undervalued in our systems. And this is something that's happening here. So this isn't an international um, issue that we just hear about here and there. Our North American turtles are being poached from the wild. These are just some headlines from recent cases. South Carolina, Florida, Southwest Airlines, more Florida, things like that. Essentially, this is happening domestically, and then some of our turtles are also being shipped internationally. And in the span of just four years, nine cases were prosecuted at the national level, and those nine cases involved over 22,000 turtles. And those were just the turtles that we knew about. So when people are prosecuted, usually it's the turtles that they have on hand, is that what, what's being counted. Some of these people, before they were prosecuted, had been trafficking turtles for years. So a single individual could have trafficked thousands of turtles just by themselves. Many of these turtles are also inhumanely shipped in this process. They're dehydrated, they're um, not given food, they're taped up with duct tape and stuffed in socks and containers. And the reason for all of this is if they go to the bathroom or move, that would alert wildlife officials at different ports and shipping facilities that there's a live animal in those containers. And so anything they can do to conceal and stop those animals from moving is what they do. And a lot of them die in this process and those that do survive, um, sometimes because they're shipped in such terrible conditions and packed together, it makes it really ripe for passing on diseases like ronavirus. So this is a later stage ronavirus right here. And if you've looked at the news lately, there was just somebody in Virginia who was just busted for essentially selling Eastern box turtles on Facebook Marketplace thousands of box turtles on um, Facebook Marketplace. And so this went on for several years. So um, in 2018, a group of biologists with the Northeastern Partners of Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, so NEPARC, which is your regional park um, group, they got together and they said, this is a problem. We're noticing lots of issues with uh, lots of poaching with our turtles. And at that time in the Northeast, they formed this collaborative to combat the illegal trade in turtles or the CCITT. And so this was just in the Northeast, but as they started getting together and making space to talk about this problem and tackle this issue, they realized it was a lot more widespread and there was a lot more interest. So in 2020, they joined the Partners of Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, AKA PARC, so they are now one of our national working groups within PARC. 
And we have a mission statement to advance um, efforts to better understand, prevent, eliminate the illegal collection and trade of North America's native turtles, a threat that puts many species at risk. So we're all working on this together. Um, we have almost 200 members. It's a closed group because we try to keep it as a space that law enforcement, biologists, social scientists, and others involved in tackling these organized crime networks and, and dealing with this trade can exchange information in a way that, that um, you, we can still prosecute cases and things of that nature. So we have a lot of moving parts. We have a lot of great projects looking at research and data, looking at education and human dimensions of the illegal trade, specifically looking at things like how to reduce demand and make behavior change happen in a scientific matter. So we've got a lot of great things going on at the national level, and I'm really, really happy about what's happening. And in um, this wakelet that I'm going to post here, I'm going, I have a couple links to some articles that have been put together by the CCITT folks, as well as a recent article that was in the Wildlife Professional about the illegal trade in turtles and our work with the collaborative. So I don't want you to leave essentially feeling really sad about all these turtles that I made you excited about and knowing that they are under lots of threats and pressures. But there are a lot of things that you as an individual and collectively as a community that, can, that you can do essentially to help our turtles. And one of the number one things is keeping wild turtles wild. We have a phrase that we like to use, hashtag every turtle counts. And that's because every individual really does matter for our turtle populations. And so taking a single individual from the wild sometimes can have some subpopulation level effects. And if you want a turtle, there are lots of turtles that are actually in facilities at shelters and places like that that are looking for a home. So there are many different places that you can get a turtle. And locally, there's the Mid-Atlantic Turtle and Tortoise Rescue um, Society or MATS that is an excellent place to get a turtle if you want to bring a turtle into your home. So always keep wild turtles wild. Um, one thing I like to suggest too is not sharing public locations of turtles. So we just had the city nature challenge and things like that. A best practice with any turtle sightings is to select this geo privacy setting and close it just so you're not inadvertently leading people to turtle populations. And we see this happen sometimes with these heavily poached species like wood turtles and spotted turtles and things like that. The best um, course of action is only to report county level locations of turtles publicly. We do know poachers use social media, they use reports, <laughs> they use all sorts of stuff to gather information and data, which is another reason why um, we have that CCITT as a closed group to um, prevent sharing some of these local locations of, of extremely sensitive species. Another thing you can do is report any wildlife crime that you see. So the Fish and Wildlife Service runs a tip line that you can call anonymously. And then we also have the Natural Resources Police here in Maryland where you can call and report any potential um, wildlife crime that you think might be occurring. I'm gonna get into um, getting the shell off the road, but helping them cross the road, as well as um, making a home for turtles and supporting education programs in a second. So in terms of turtles crossing the road, this is a common phenomenon that's gonna be happening in May and June because they're looking for love and places to lay their eggs. So if it is safe to do so, and unfortunately it is not always safe to, um, to help turtles across the road, but if it's safe to do so, pull over and help that turtle in the direction that it's traveling in. If you take it back to where it was coming from, it's just gonna go right back across that road. So um, always place it in the direction of a travel just on the other side. And even if you see that turtle, like that snapping turtle way away from water, not seemingly in the best location, it's best to understand that the turtle knows best. They have an internal GPS that's telling them where they need to go. 
But if you move them too far away from where their GPS, their internal GPS system works, it might confuse them. So don't re relocate them. And there's only extreme cases where relocation is really something that is recommended. And most, excuse me, most of the time, it's just best to move them to the other side of the road and let the turtle do its turtley thing. If you do find injured turtles, um, please try to take them to a vet or a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. And um, there's this Animal Help Not Now um, website that you can go to, and that is something you can go to at any, anywhere you are in the United States. Maryland DNR also runs a list of licensed wildlife rehabilitators that'll take turtles to. If you want to make home for turtles, this is all what I used to do with Backyard Wildlife Habitat Program Wild Acres. And essentially, the biggest thing is planting native plants because native plants are going to provide native foods like um, fruit bearing plants, like raspberries, strawberries, may apples, things like that. Delicious foods for our different types of turtles. And then also those native plants are going to bring in insects and other invertebrates that those turtles um, are also going to eat. Similarly, if you limit pesticide use um, in your backyards, that will also allow for food to be available for the different turtle species that might visit. If you're killing off all the insects in your yard and the slugs and stuff like that, it's not going to make it a very appealing habitat for box turtles. Another thing is um, not moving wildlife. So again, going back to not relocating turtles into places that you think might be better for them, the turtles know best. And um, something to keep in mind too is, is not supplementing predators. So if you've got raccoons and foxes and skunks and you're intentionally feeding them or unintentionally feeding them and causing them to congregate under things like bird feeders that aren't kept clean, or compost piles that they might be getting into. If you're supplementing those predators, you're making that area kind of unsafe for your turtle species and other species of potential prey items. So something to keep in mind there. And then of course, cats. Cats aren't just a, a bird issue. They also threaten other wildlife species, particularly our hatchling turtles can sometimes be um, attacked by cats that are outside. So some key education messages that we like to get across to, to folks are, number one, turtles are important. Number two, they're vulnerable and every turtle counts and they need intervention. So we need to help our turtles by helping them cross the road, by keeping them wild and creating that habitat. And there are a lot of different resources out there. So PARC has a lot of resources as we come up on Wild Turtle Week later this month. And your local Northeast Park also has some great information about box turtles as well. So if you're interested in more information about our local turtle species, check out the Northeast Park or Knee Park. It's a great organization to get involved with. There's also a box turtle workshop that's happening down in Georgia this fall if you really, really want to learn more about box turtles. Oops. And then, of course, um, the National Park, which I represent, we have a lot of things going on, including Wild Turtle Week, which I'll show you on the next slide. The Amphibian Reptile Conservancy helps us do all the things that we do, and they do a lot of on-the-ground conservation work, particularly with preserving and conserving habitats. And then, of course, your local Maryland Department of Natural Resources has lots of great information all about turtles and other local wildlife species here in the state. I'll also put in a plug on May 21st, the Sunday before Wild Turtle Week. I'll be at the Natural History Society in, in Maryland and Baltimore. I'll be giving basically the same talk, but they'll also have Wild Turtle Day happening. So they'll have a bunch of family friendly events about um, teaching about turtles and learning about turtles and, and all sorts of stuff there. So next week, we have Amphibian Week coming up. Um, this is a celebration of all things amphibian. We've got a lot of events that are happening both virtually and online, or virtually and in person, mostly in the DC region, but we've got some other things that are happening. And uh, as I mentioned, later on this month, we'll have Wild Turtle Week with also uh, a lot of stuff happening with turtles and celebrating all things turtle then. And with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. I see a couple in the chat that I've missed. And thank you. 
Thank you so much, Carrie. That was amazing and fascinating. And that image of the turtles scooping up the jellyfish <laughs> was pretty incredible. But uh, we do have uh, some questions in the chat if you want to take a look at them. And um, we do have to let Carrie go right at the top of the hour because she's going to be working on her big study on uh, the illegal trade. I mean, when is that coming out, Carrie? Well, we have a, a collaborative research paper that we're working on, and hopefully it will be coming out in Polonian Conservation Biology this fall. There's supposed to be a special issue all devoted to the illegal trade in turtles. So, Great, thanks. So I'll let you go to those questions. All right, thank you. So I see a question from Laura Ross. Um, if you dig up hibernating turtles or eggs, should they just be covered back up? And yes, that is the best course of action. If you're digging in the garden or moving stuff around and you accidentally dig them up, just cover them back up. Um, it's best not to move them unless you absolutely have to move them. And in terms of turtle eggs and most reptile eggs, moving them is, is not going to allow them to be viable anymore. So you really don't want to move turtle eggs. Um, just uh, just that, that there. So. Um, I see a question from John too. So turtles have an internal GPS, but how do they communicate, find each other? They go to a breeding site and search until they get lucky. Yeah, they kind of, they, they turn to roam a lot more and go outside their normal home ranges, at least for, I'm speaking in terms of box turtles because some turtle species are a little more social, but um, box turtles and snapping turtles will roam to find mates essentially. So they will um, go really long distances just to find somebody to breed with. And so that's why you see some of them in uh, different areas this time of year. Um, so some turtles also can communicate with, with one another. We thought that turtle communication wasn't really existent, but there's even some evidence that some female turtles might actually communicate with her developing eggs. There was just a paper that came out this past fall talking about that, just really blowing the lid of, off of what we thought about with turtle communications and everything, and just going to show you that we really know this much in this wide world of wildlife. So, all right. Um, I see a question from Susan. Are there any turtles that are legal to sell as food? And um, she saw some turtles that were for sale in California. And yes, there are some turtles that are legal for sale for, for food. We actually ship, the United States ships millions of turtles, mostly hatchlings, but millions of turtles overseas legally each year for food markets outside of the United States. We also have domestic food markets and we don't know very much about domestic food markets. There have been um, like some species that are in the food trade are snapping turtles, as well as um, soft shell turtles. They tend, and some of the sliders, those are some of the major um, food turtle species that are found in the United States. see a question about from Karen Anderson, do you vet the people who are in your closed group? Are they known entity? And yes, there is an application process for the CCITT. Um, and that application process is um, gone over. Uh, essentially, we have a leadership board and a steering committee that vote on people. But in addition to applying and saying why you want to be part of it and showing your credentials and everything, we also have references that Essentially, it's like a job interview to become part of the CCITT. So, um, so it is a process and we try our best to make sure that we have the right people being represented in the group. So, all right. And See Karen, a question? There's a question from, high, uh, uh, from early on in the talk. How did the box turtle get its name? Oh, you know, I don't know for sure, but I imagine it's probably because they can close up into their shells. They're the one of the few turtle species that can fully pull themselves into their shells like like a box. But if somebody else knows, then feel free to add that in the chat or unmute yourself and let us know. And then um, 
Edwin just sent in a question. What about terrapins? We have them nesting on the Patuxent here in Solomons. Yeah, so that's the Maryland State Reptile, the Diamondback Terrapin. Um, and we have Northern Diamondback Terrapins. As you go down south, Florida's got a couple different subspecies, um, like the Gulf Coast Terrapins and, and all of that. So they are a species of greatest conservation need. They are not on an official Maryland DNR list. Um, so they're a species of concern, just like, like box turtles are a species of concern, but not legally listed in the state. And um, they're under the same threats as other turtles, but probably climate change is a really big factor um, with uh, the weather, and, um, and nesting and all of that for those terrapins. There also is an illegal trade for diamondback terrapins as well. Um, so there was actually someone in New Jersey that was illegally harvesting pregnant females and selling thousands of pregnant females from New Jersey. And some of them actually made their way to Maryland actually. Um, so we do know that that is happening and it's just the tip of the iceberg of what's occurring with our terrapins, so. And Carrie, there's a couple of more questions just entered, but I wonder if you could tell people what the link is you put at the top of the chat. Yeah, so the link is, is um, it's a, called a wakelet, but it's just a, a resource that has a bunch of different links in it. So it has links to Wild Turtle Week, it has links to some of the articles about the CCITT and some of the illegal turtle trade things that have been happening as links to the Maryland DNR website on turtles. So it's full of turtly good information there. Cool, thanks. And if you have time for those last couple of questions, but if you have to go, we totally understand. <laughs> sure, I will, I will jump in these last couple of questions. So Larry and Gwen ask, um, you said there are places to get turtles, but I, I was told they wouldn't survive if you moved them. What's the story? So um, in terms of that question, do you mean like places to adopt turtles or are you talking about um, places to get turtles from the wild, I guess? So oh, places to adopt turtles, yeah. And so the thing with moving turtles in the wild, relocating turtles in the wild, they, a lot of them try to get back to their original home range. And so they will continuously search and things like that instead of doing the things they need to do, like getting food and breeding and everything. And so that's why many of the relocated turtles do not survive. And there's actually some studies being done with some seized box turtles because we have some seizures of several hundred box turtles and we don't know where they came from. So we don't know where to put them back to, to repatriate them. And they're, um, the researchers are putting them in different pens in these research areas and looking at their behaviors and seeing if there is a way to essentially get those box turtles to repatriate in new locations, like how many are going to survive in all of that. So that research I believe is still ongoing. Um, and so we're still learning a little bit more about that. In terms of, of adopting turtles, um, when you adopt a turtle and you bring them under your care, they don't have to worry about finding habitat and food and all of that. So they're not going to be continuously searching for those things because you're providing those things. And that's how they are able to survive. But some wild caught turtles don't do well in captivity just because they're used to wild caught foods. <laughs> they have a particular palate and all of that. And they also are used to things like um, hibernating in particular areas and all of that. So they don't always thrive as well as something that might be captive bred or captive raised. So hopefully that helps answer your question there. And the last question I see is how far north do alligator snapping turtles get and they could they be moving into southern Maryland? And I don't have my field guide handy. Um, I don't know how far north the alligator snapping turtles get. I want to say Georgia. Um, but they're mostly a southern species. You're going to find them in like Florida and Louisiana and Texas and all of that. Um, there have been a couple instances of snapping turtles found in Maryland and in Virginia, but they've all been released individuals. So, um, yeah. <laughs>
Harry, thank you so, so much. This has been a fascinating presentation. Your work is amazing. And thanks so much for sharing it with us. Thank you for the invitation, Molly. And thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Bye. Have a great evening. Good night, everybody.